All right, everybody. Welcome back. It's been a few weeks since our last installment of the Metal Blade Records live series, but we are back again, not going anywhere. I'm your host, as always, Riley McShane, vocalist for A Legion, and I am joined today by ATF Sinner of the band Hate out of Poland. How you doing, man? I'm good. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Yeah, I'm ready to answer your questions. Oh, yeah. If you, um, you've got a few there. <laughs> I have I've got a lot of them. I've got... <laughs> so, I mean, first, first and foremost, let's let's talk about uh, some new music on the horizon, which I'm sure everybody is excited to hear about. New album, Rugia, coming out on Friday, October 15th. Tell us a little bit about the album. Well, the album is, um, uh, is uh, you can say, the third chapter of the last three albums originated, I mean, this the, the covers, um, you know, um, Slavic mythology, uh, and we originated it with uh, Tremendum 2017, and then we continued on uh, Ori Gates of Veles, and now Rugia. So this is like the third part of a of a bigger story, and um, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to to have to you know have it released finally. And um, if this is the you know uh, the result of the pandemic because we we're trying to make the best use of the time given and uh, uh, and um, I think it was a kind of therapy for us also composing and, and later recording the album so uh, yeah it's good to that, that we have it and uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic by the way I think it would have taken us more time to complete the record but. Here we are with the new album. Yeah, uh, it's good. It's a yeah. paradox, but yeah, it, it it is. It's you know, it's it's exciting though uh, that so many bands have kind of been free. Uh, you know, being in a professional band, you know, releasing albums, touring, doing all that stuff. It's very time consuming, and a lot of creative types generally have a process, right? Something that they, you know, need to set aside time for and really commit to for a long period of time in order to make the best you know product or the best thing that yeah you know, but, that, but that this time we had art. we had a lot of time you know no, yeah. time, no time pressure okay yeah once in in many years i must say okay so uh uh right after the tour well you this was a european tour with uh Belfigur and suffocation that had to be stopped right in the middle and we came back home and it became clear that no tour or festival would happen in the foreseeable future okay and then then we decided to focus on writing and um i think after like eight months or something like that we were ready with the with, with the songs and got the green light from the label started recording it was also a, quite a lengthy process because it, it it took us like five months altogether with some breaks um so uh, yeah we had this comfort uh and uh, we didn't have to you know speed it up of, of course, at the at the end of recording, always it's the situation is that you time seems to be accelerating, and it was this time it was the same. But um, but we are really happy about the final result and can't wait for it to be released. That that is awesome, man. So uh, I want to talk about the recording uh, process a little bit. You know, your your press release mentions that you uh did the recording and the mixing at hertz recording studios with the uh, vislaski brothers uh who yeah. for those of you watching uh who are unfamiliar with their work they've worked uh with bands like behemoth and decapitated uh you know great albums fantastic engineers what was the recording process like for you you mentioned that it was lengthy five months that's a that's a hefty mm. chunk of time to be recording uh, oh yeah oh, but yeah. but what kind of led to that you know did you did you try anything new was it like the result of experimentation with you know some gear uh anything like that give us a, a little bit of insight on what that process was like as, as always there there have been a lot of experimenting with different you know amplifiers different guitars and uh different kind of gear yes and um the you know the selection usually take takes time as well you know and uh, you have to make a lot of decision throughout the process but uh uh yeah we uh, it wasn't the first time for us to, um, um, collaborating with the brothers the famous brothers <laughs> it was uh it was the fifth album actually that we did with them 
and uh, so we, we've known each other for years you know and uh, it's um, it's it's really good to to work with them each time i must say and um, this time was no different i mean uh, we um, we were looking for some particular harshness of the record okay we didn't want it to sound clear and very uh, transparent, so to speak. Okay, we wanted we wanted it to have some some rawness, some harshness. So, this was the one of the problems that we had to solve uh, at the end of the mixing process. Okay, how to make the record, how to give it a, the, this particular character, and we used um, this old school tape recorder uh, produced in in uh, East Germany, in, you know, in the time so communist regime and uh, there's still one manufacturer in Germany producing this this thick tape and so we use this for mixing the the drums and the, and I think guitars in part and also for for the mastering so so it it gave this uh, this special character to, to the record which I which I really love I must say and uh, and uh, yeah and um, it's not so easy at the, at the at the beginning to you know to get used to it maybe. Uh, however, you appreciate it after a while when you you know get used to the 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 overall sound. So I'm really happy about the the production part as well. Yeah, yeah. it's it's you know I feel it's worth mentioning that uh, there's been at least from what I've seen, uh, especially with like old school death metal. Uh, bands and even more modern death metal bands, there's been this real cool return to form as far as production goes over the past few years. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, for for the better part of the last decade, uh, I'd even say even earlier than that, even like some of the technical death metal bands that started coming out in like 2006, 2007, there was this really high bar of production set where everything was super clean and super crisp. And that's great. I love, you know, very clean, high quality production for certain things, but I'm finding that there's kind of become a vacuum at this point where a lot of these bands that have had super crisp, super perfect, you know, digital tone type of production are returning to this you know rudimentary form of recording that like you said gives things so much more character um so that's really exciting for me personally that's, because that's, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for yeah uh, yes each time and uh and um actually the our previous album Ori Gates of Vell has also had the same more or less the same character so this is it's it's in the same vibe same vein here and uh uh, yeah, the, of course, there are some new elements on, on the new album, okay, comparing with the previous records, for example, more technical parts, you could say, um, death metal oriented parts, uh, maybe, but um, all the other main features of, of the hate sound are there, so you can, you can call it like 100% hate album with all the necessary features on it. Like some, you know, black metal elements and the and uh, maybe some doom um, uh, uh, elements as well uh, here and there, some melodic stuff as well, you know. So I'm really happy about the record because I can see that it really has all those important elements that have been present in, in our music over the over the years. Yeah, it's like a it's like a good, you know, um, some summing up something like that yeah <laughs> yeah no that's awesome man and uh you know it's 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 important i feel and it's also a very delicate balance for a lot of bands to you know maintain their you know tried and true original sound without letting it go stale and incorporating new things whether it's from the writing side of things or the production side of things and it seems like you've managed to accomplish that uh, between records, which kind of leads me into my next question. I wanted to talk about uh, the little like trilogy you have going on, right? Like this trilogy of albums. Um, Rugia is the Slavic word for uh, the island of Rugen. And stop me if I'm wrong. Uh, correct me on anything. Feel free to jump <laughs> yeah. in. Uh, uh, which is true. True. Uh, a German island in the northeast. What is the significance there? And and you know what what is it about the kind of slavic mythology that mm -hmm. uh has 
has drawn you to it and tied all of these albums together? Yeah, this uh, the island you mentioned, uh, which is now the German German island of Rugen, okay. But the archaic Slavic name for it is Rugia, and that's that's where we get it from. And uh, this was a like a, um, this was a very important place back in the days. It was like a religious and military hub of the Western Slavic paganism that lasted for. Uh, until 12th century, so very long time, um, and um, it was this famous place where where uh, Arcona, famous Arcona Temple, was located as well. Okay, so so uh, it was uh, you can call it the last bastion of Slavic paganism in Europe, you know, and uh, mm, this 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 idea um, inspired us a lot. I think we we wanted to to make an album that would be a tribute album to this, you know, uh, tribal Slavic structures that uh, somehow survived amidst the Christian countries uh, all around. Um, by the way, Poland was was Christianized, was baptized for two hundred years already, and they were still pagan, you know. Um, so. Um, um, this is a um, a very in, inspiring stuff for me, my, for for myself, like personally, because it's um, I could say I, I discover my deeper, uh, more profound identity with this Slavic stories. You know, I'm a Slav myself, so it's like a, a part of my genetic makeup here, and uh, and. Um, the um, the island of Rugia and uh, the you know the let's say the Rugian mysticism or something like that okay as 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 far as we as we can reconstruct it because there haven't been many uh, written um, evidence preserved you know but uh, a lot has been discovered uh, in the recent years so it's very it's very inspiring I think that we will continue with this I mean. It's not the end of the story. Uh, it's like, a, as you said, trilogy. But as I said, it's a vast topic, um, Slavic mysticism. That, so I think that uh, we will go on with this for nice. sure. <clears throat> nice. That's that's all super interesting. I uh, have have been a big fan of you know studying the interconnectedness between different mythologies and different religious ideologies and how they all have kind of borrowed from each other. Uh, over time um and as they've each developed and i was actually just talking to a friend about this last night about how many modern uh you know like super religions like whether it's you know christianity catholicism islam whatever it might be like they a lot of them borrow so heavily from paganism um and totally. it's funny because a lot of these things aren't really recognized in that way it's it's very like yeah, you know, on, on Easter Sunday, we celebrate, you know, Jesus coming out of the tomb and resurrecting. And how do we do that? By, uh, you know, collecting eggs and doing stuff with rabbits and all that kind of stuff. And exactly. and, and why do we do that? I, I don't know, man. We just do it. Don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> there are still a lot of pagan elements in those in those uh, uh, holidays. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it's cool to, uh, you know, see this showcasing of some of that information that to a lot of people is has been lost to time uh you know through your music i think that that's a super uh crucial role for artists to continue to play um you know you look at at the the role of bards even way back in the day you know their whole job was to to bring oral histories and you know tell exactly. stories and do yeah. all that kind of stuff so I, uh, I love the, I love this stuff. I must say, yeah. yeah. I think that's really cool, man. I I really really vibe with that that uh whole thing. And even as, though it's a tip... with... oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please continue. Oh, I was just gonna say, even though it's a a trilogy now, I'm excited to see how the tetralogy plays out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the you know the the Slavic mythology, like every mythology, is a collection of stories, a collection of beliefs. Which which are pretty universal, you know. It's uh, they they touch upon a lot of um, existential and existential questions. So we can still find a lot of contemporary meanings in them. So I, I treat them as as a frame 
looking for some meanings that would be important for us contemporary people and uh, and looking at this the in this way i think it, it's a great source of inspiration i mean it's we can go on for a few albums uh at least still with this <laughs> hell yeah well uh you know speaking of and i want to just you know touch on this uh really quickly because i feel like it's it's important and surely must have some uh, some play into uh, your history as a band and and the subject matter that you cover in your music. Uh, Poland obviously has a very rich history of of metal. Uh, lots of very important metal bands, death metal bands, have come out of yeah. Poland. Um, and I feel that a lot of that has to do with this kind of ping pong game of uh, you know the religious. Uh, climate in Poland and like the death metal mm -hmm. uh, kind of attitude. Can you kind of explain, I guess, how religion and metal plays into the Polish society? Mm. Yeah, well, Poland, uh, <laughs> um, very conservative and mostly Catholic country, right? Yeah. So um, what does this mean for a rebellious teenager that wants to you know, create something, create a band, like metal band, for example. It is, uh, it's a, like a natural enemy, the state together with the, with the religion, which is very strong here. And it, it, it goes hand in hand. So you have politics and religion in this country interconnecting. And it's, um, uh, it is something you just go rebellious against, you know, uh, when you're a teenager. And... Uh, and this is that's why I believe uh, most of uh, of the Polish uh, metal bands, you know, are like deeply anti-Christian, anti-religious or pagan, you know, in this respect, and um, and simply against the system, which means against the the church as well here. Okay, and um, the role of metal. Well, the the scene is is really. Um, a very prolific one, you know. Some some say the some some talk about the Polish death metal phenomenon because it's it, it, observing it over the years. It's like one wave after another of of different bands playing extreme metal on this or, or other way. But it is all uh, very dark, very declared, so to speak. Okay, and um, yeah, I um, I I must say I'm a, I'm a I am proud to be a part of this, and I I am proud to be. To play some role in this because I, I know that we we also inspired a lot of other bands because uh, started pretty early at the beginning of the 90s you know uh, so it's a long story and uh, mm, yeah it's uh it's, it's it's a great it's a great uh, thing to be to be a part of this let's say metal community here in in, the, in this country and of course it is very important for many people um and uh, there are lots of metal heads in our country you know and uh, the scene is is uh, is uh, growing all the time uh, yeah. i must say even though it is not the mainstream and it will never be i mean it's uh, we we're not we're we're absent in the media okay and uh, not only traditional media but also in the in some we're somewhere we have our own world so to speak okay um behemoth is just one example it's just one exception i would say okay because they they provoked more so they were more visible and you know and this is another story but all the rest i think uh, like function in in in, um, in our own bubble in our own say sh shadow so to speak you know <clears throat> comfortable place yes in this <laughs> yeah that's you know i i feel like that mode of existence right i feel very strongly that that contributes to what makes the community and the scene so prolific is it's it's almost it's almost like a like a freedom through bondage type of thing right is it's like it's you know being yeah. in in that kind of you know vacuous space and being able to exist outside of the usual purview of where 
you know, the the metal media or the mainstream media or whatever exists gives you a lot more freedom to uh, fully express yourself. And, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And and uh, the sense of being a part of some, say, artistic elite, which is somewhere, um, you know, um, uh, aside of, of, of the mainstream. This, this is also... I think kind of uh, important here, um, I think here for, for many artists that not just the metal artists, you know, not just uh, metal heads, but people who create something which is not uh, popular among the, you know, Catholic conservative uh, media or, or, um, or other entities, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Super interesting, super interesting stuff. I'd love to be, you know, a fly on the wall for the past 20, 30 years to, to see just how that's developed. Uh, you know, just the, the history nerd in me uh, is, is always really fascinated with how these different scenes and communities kind of pop up and grow. Um, so that's, that's really cool to be talking to someone who's been a part of that for that whole uh, period of time. But getting, getting back to the music really quickly, uh, I wanted to talk about... Um, you know, you mentioned that you you did this this tape mixing type of thing with the drumming, um, but you also have a new drummer, Narsil. How yeah. uh, how did do you think he uh, fit into the new sound of the record? Did he bring something new to the table, or was it you know something where it was it was more like oh, okay, like you know this is this is our sound, this is how you want to play all this kind of stuff? Um, it it was kind of spontaneous with him because. Um, on the tour that I that I mentioned, uh, the beginning of our of our discussion, which was this uh, the, the tour that we were playing right before the pandemic, okay, um, he was replacing um, our previous drummer Pavulon on that on that particular tour because Pavulon had had some real uh, big um, health issue. He just informed us that he he wouldn't be able to continue, so. Narsil was a, replace, a replacement for him. Okay, so this was this was the actually the first tour that we were playing with him. And after the tour, when it um, when it was clear that uh, Pavlon is not coming back and um, shows are not coming back as well, you know, there's like nothing uh, going on in the foreseeable future. We just went we just went with the flow and started um, working on some new stuff with him. And he's, um, he's a young, talented, very determined guy. Um, we also share some, you know, taste in music. So it, w it was pretty easy to, uh, to, to work with him. And uh, um, as I said, it was like a spontaneous decision, but it, uh, but it went really quickly. And we, we completed the most of the material in, I don't know, eight, nine months or something like that. And um, um, having him on board, I wanted to expose his um, technical skills, you know, because he's more like death metal oriented. So I, I wanted to expose here and there um, some more death metal oriented stuff. But it, it was actually planned before. But uh, this, this was like uh, one more excuse to, you know, to play like more technical parts here and there and uh, and this is very good i think it is it is one of the uh, of the important features of the of the new album rugia um that is a combination of uh, death metal which is actually the where we come from the the death metal of the 90s you know so it's it's present on the on the record and uh, and also there there are you know black metal elements some monumental stuff as well and uh, yeah, working with him was was on the on the songs was quite uh, kind of easy. But as I always stress, this it's a hate is, a, is like a collective effort. Okay, so so I usually it looks like this. I come up with the with the main ideas, both riffs and and, and arrangements, and then we work together on them. And then the other guys join in throughout the process, and they and they add something to uh, to it okay they have some input and then uh, 
it's important for me that everybody is everybody identifies with the record and and you know finds himself on it and um, so yes so the other guys TRMS bass guitar and Domin uh, lead guitar they they also played an important role on the album and is it's as I said it's a collective effort and I'm I'm really happy about this hell yeah too. that's awesome man it's it's always nice when a a new member kind of just gels with the existing dynamic. Uh, and it sounds like that was something that you managed to accomplish with this new one. So that's very exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the pandemic as often uh, is the case with these, these interviews, especially at this juncture in time. Um, but something that I wanted to ask you because, uh, you know, to see if, if there's a unique ex perspective that you can provide for us uh, is, is why you think it is that a lot of bands have written some of their best material during this pandemic. And I know we've kind of touched on it briefly about, you know, having the time and no distractions and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, if you would, I'd like to hear you know, your, your take on why you think that is. And the, the reason for that, if you're viewing and not uh, someone with insider knowledge is that, uh, uh, our friend ATF here has a, uh, degree in psychology, um, <laughs> yeah, something <true>. that, <laughs> something that, uh, you know, not a lot of other people have, especially when assessing things like mm. why, you know, being put into a pandemic type situation for bands has kind of pulled something out of them that has led to this just immense creative surge. Yeah, well, it's a it's a hard question to answer actually because it's a very individual thing, uh, I believe, you know. But uh, but this argument that uh, most of the bands uh, at one point didn't have to run, didn't have to be, you know, at very quick pace, and had some time to to sit and think over some stuff that they create, you know. Um, this is this is probably the main the main reason here why uh why uh some of the bands you mentioned you know come up with a very good records because usually um uh you have tours you have festivals okay you have some other things to, to take care of and then you don't have you have you don't have that much time to really think the, the, the stuff over you know and um, same with the studio usually your time is limited you have to you have to be quick especially at the beginning at, at the end of the, of the recording and mixing you know this this time it was a bit different not just for us but for everybody i think and um and also the maybe the the, the second explanation to this can be that the the overall atmosphere of the pandemic okay and this uncertainty because you don't really know what would happen you don't really know if if the festivals would come back or if this tour uh, is going to happen or not, and so on. Um, it uh, maybe it is uh, kind of inspired, you know, um, people that well, um, um, uh, let's let's do it in let's let's you know take it in like approach this in some other way this time, okay? Like very seriously, like m maybe more seriously. Maybe it's it's the end of the world, and this is our last record, something like that, you know. Right. The, I'm I'm talking about the atmosphere, of course, okay, because as you know, the, this pandemic had been very dramatic for a lot of guys in the, in, in the business and in, in the metal scene. So, um, yeah, so that that would be my my explanation. But this is uh, this is only guessing. Uh, it's as I say, it's very individual yeah. when it comes to. Yeah, but um, but in this case, uh, in our case, it was it was just the situation was like was a bit more comfortable when it comes to writing and recording, and uh, and also, um, yeah, we were well motivated to 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 do the record, you know, quicker because if it wasn't for the pandemic, it would it would uh, have taken us more time, definitely. Right. Right. I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh, that that element of not knowing uh, whether or not, you know, festivals were going to happen or, or tours were going to happen again. It's been kind of existing in this this realm of uncertainty. And yeah, I think that has a lot to do with 
fueling the creative engine. Um, it's interesting because I've never really thought about it that way until I heard you say it, that, you know, being in a situation of uncertainty is very stressful. It can lead to a lot of emotional turmoil and, and angst of just being. Oh yeah. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah. And it's, it's very, very interesting. You know, I feel like a light bulb just kind of clicked on in my head Mm. hearing, hearing that being said out loud that it's like, yeah, this, this atmosphere of just not knowing this, this uncertain, stressful gray area that so many artists have just been living in for the past, you know, almost two years. Uh, oh yeah, has, absolutely. Has got to have some kind of huge impact on the frustration that comes along with like really good creative death metal writing, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's 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 amazing. You just blew well, my mind they, a little they, bit, in, man. In, in, yes, in in this way, a lot of artists that I know, you know, treated this as a therapy, as a kind of therapy, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, what can you do? You can you can the best therapy for you is. Uh, is what you create okay and uh and uh, yes i'm not sure if i can express it well in english but uh, <laughs> i would express it better in polish but this is this is a uh, this is uh like uh you know um some safety space for you okay something yes. that that you that you know very well some some room which is your own realm and you have you have influence on this at least on this, you know what I mean. Absolutely. You maybe you, you you don't have uh, like real influence on the on what's going on around, but on this you you do have influence. Okay, so let's do this. Let's concentrate on this. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Using a little bit of you know finding a place where you can be in control and have have exactly. that exactly. that that uncertainty kind of subside at least while you're creating art and making music that's yeah absolutely man that's what i'm that's what i mean exactly hitting hitting the nail on the head with that one that is very very true um so i have a a quick uh a quick aside a quick question from a fan uh who goes by the handle lion of knowledge and their question (laughs) is did you use the warhead for any guitar tracks he probably saw a warhead amplifier on one of the pictures. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the answer to this is no, not this time, not this time. We were we were testing it. Uh, uh, yes, it's true. We were uh, we we were, we were trying to you know to get some to make use of this this particular one, but uh, but not on this session. We we decided on on some other equipment this time, but warhead. Uh, was used on if he is interested is the answer it's uh, it has been it was used on um, Anaclasis album 2005 so actually all the album I, I recorded on this one this particular uh, amplifier which I really love I mean I, I really love the sound um, but uh, but not for this record okay not for this kind of sound that we were looking for this time but it's a great it's a great amplifier great amplifier absolutely highly recommended yeah (laughs) (laughs) uh well you know now that we've talked about you know the pandemic and touring and all that kind of stuff do you have any tentative touring plans obviously i know you know if nothing's been announced you can't really mention specifics but are there are there plans at least to uh get back out on the road possibly out to the states again Oh yeah, well, uh, coming back to the states is uh, is definitely one of our priorities, and and we already talked to the American agent about this. So we'll be working on this uh, in next year, I'm sure. Uh, nothing confirmed yet, but uh, yeah, definitely, it's as as I say, it's it's one of our priorities. But uh, but about um, the tours that had been uh, have been already uh confirmed so the first uh, the first tour is going to happen in february march next year it's uh, it's again the tour with suffocation and belfagor in europe so it's like coming back to the same tour that was stopped back then two years ago okay um it's a symbolic coming back like close i hope closing this this whole pandemic uh and uh, this time it's 30 
30 shows, something like that. So one, one month on tour, full-fledged tour in Europe. And then we, we have another one with uh, Vader playing like a direct support to Vader in Scandinavia. Um, a great opportunity for us. I, I, I love this idea. And then one more in Asia. Um, and some festivals as well, you know. So it, it looks like a, a busy period coming yeah. up next year, definitely. And um, and I'm pretty sure that we will be very active concert-wise. I'm pretty sure of it because it is it is the essence of, of what we do, actually. I mean, the essence of, of hate it has always been uh, playing live shows and uh, it's one of the most it's one of the most important aspects of of our activity and uh, i cannot even imagine this band without doing this you know yeah so uh, we we would like we would love to uh, uh, come back to america and I, and I know that we have a lot of fans there and a lot of people are waiting for the new album and uh, i hope they uh, they will love uh, the new album as much as we do. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's pretty late over there uh, in Poland. So thank you for, for joining us for this interview Thanks and so answering much. all of these questions. It was a pleasure. Yeah, man. It was it was a real good okay. one. I really enjoyed all the, all the insight uh, and the... Uh, you know, rather intellectual nature of, of the band and, and, you know, some of your answers were just really, really great. <laughs> helped, helped me come to a few realizations that I didn't know that I needed to. Uh, <laughs> so super cool. Uh, for Thanks everybody watching for the conversation. Yeah, of yeah. course, man. And uh, for everybody watching, you know, as just mentioned, lots of tours coming up, make sure to check out when they're going to be in your neighborhood, pick up a ticket with, the pandemic ending and touring coming back it is more important than ever to get out of the house go see some shows support some bands and uh bring our little death metal community back to life so to speak absolutely uh, absolutely and until then this friday rugia dropping uh on metal yes, blade records and exactly and and the tuesday next week a new video like a regular video for the song exercise of pantheon has been uh, just finished um a very good one i love it and i highly recommend it hell yeah hell yeah i'm excited for all of it man well thank you again so much for talking to us for those of you watching at home i'm your host thanks a lot riley mcshane uh singer for a legion host of this metal blade live series podcast and i will see you next time thanks again for joining us